In this video, we're going to be looking at a vector application known as a resultant velocity, also sometimes called motion in a stream, which I'll be honest is a term that I basically just use, so it'll be applying really just to what we are talking about in class. What are we going to be doing? We're going to define what is meant by the term relative motion. We're going to define what is meant by the term resultant velocity. We're going to review how to add vectors to the tip tail method to find a resultant. And we're going to be applying vector addition to the motion of objects. Why are we doing this? Because all motion is always seen from a from an observer's point of view, and different observers could view the same event differently. If we can understand how different observers can view the same event differently, we can then effectively compare two different observations and find out what the result truly really is. This also will enable us then to change our points of view effectively to find the point of view that is most convenient for our problem. Because while it's true that all points of view are equally valid and correct, sometimes one point of view is just easier to work with than another. And if we can change our points of view, at least temporarily, it often reduces the difficulty that we will have in solving certain problems. So here we have a scenario. We have two guys, A and B, and B is going to go for a walk on a stationary platform that is able to move. We want to find out what the velocity of person B is as seen by person A. So person A is our up. So if we are going to ask the questions such as, what is the velocity of person B? Uh, where does person B end up? We have to consider who our observer is. So if we were to, so we should really ask the question, what's the velocity of person B relative to person A or seen by person A. What's the final position of person B relative to person A or again seen by person A? So anytime we hear the term relative motion, we're saying seen by whatever thing that we're looking at. So if we were to say relative to the ground, then it would be a seen by the ground. So Person A will be our observer, so they are our origin. And if you notice, we have a ruler right here where person A is at the location zero because the observer is always going to be at a position of zero. Everything is being measured from them, and that is the origin on any x, y. So person B now walks to the other side of the platform and it takes a time of 1.5 seconds for them to get there. So to find the velocity as a person B seen by person A, we just have to go with the definition of average velocity, which is displacement over time. So the displacement of person B, as far as A is concerned, is of course their final position minus their initial position. So the final position of B, which is a location of five meters and their initial position, which was two meters, both to the right of the observer. So the final position is positive five, the initial is positive two, so their displacement, the change in position, is positive three meters, but three meters to the right. This happened in 1.5 seconds, so the person's average velocity, as far as person A is concerned, is positive two meters per second, or two meters per second to the right. But let's just say for fun, the person was going to be standing still on the platform, the plat so they're not gonna move at all. However, the platform itself will be moving forward. Would person A still see person B move? Well, to answer that, we have to just ask the question, does the position of person B change as far as person A is concerned? So here's person A, here's my origin, I have my ruler, and when the platform moves forward and the person stands on the platform, they also move forward with the platform. If we notice here, the back end of the platform travels from a position of positive 1.5 meters to a location of 
6.5 meters. So the displacement of the plane, sorry, the displacement of the uh, train is positive 5 meters or 5 meters to the right. This happens in a time of 1.5 seconds. And so the average velocity of the train is going to be 3.33 meters per second to the right. That's also the velocity of person B as far as A is concerned, because B starts at a location of 2 and ends at a location of 7. So there is a displacement of 5 to the right as well. So the person on the train have the exact same velocity as far as person A is concerned, because the person is just standing on the train. They're moving with the train. But let's say the person was going to walk as they did in the first problem on the train that is also moving like it just did. So the person is going to walk from one side of the train to the other in a time of 1.5 seconds as the train itself is moving forward. What would person A, C, B do? Well, in this case, they're not going to see the person travel three meters or five meters but a total of eight meters, because the person still starts at a location of two and ends at a location of set 10. So positive 10 minus positive two is positive eight. The person ended eight meters to the right of person A in a time of 1.5 seconds. This means that the average velocity is now positive 5.33 meters per second or 5 meters 5.33 meters per second to the right. Please notice that the displacement of the person overall as seen by person A is actually the displacement of the train itself plus the displacement of what person B did on their own as they walked across the train. This is a vector sum, so this is a display, so this is a resultant. So we call this displacement the resultant displacement. This means our average velocity is a resultant average velocity. So anytime we talk about average velocity, it's going to say a resultant velocity, it's going to be the vector sum of these different velocities. And so my resultant velocity of the person really is the velocity of what they personally did, which was two meters to the right, plus what the train had done, which was 3.33 meters per second to the right. So if I knew the individual velocities, I could just add them up like vectors and find out what the ground or stationary observer would see. And of course, to add our vectors, we always do them tip to tail. If necessary, we could do this to scale. We may have to use the right triangle Pythagorean theorem, sine, cosine, tangent if we have to. We could use the law of sines and cosines. The methodology is all up to us. But when the vectors all go in one along one axis, it is a lot easier to do because you can just add or subtract like regular positive and negative numbers. The reason that we'll call this often motion in a stream is by the analogy of a boat traveling in a stream or a river. The velocity that we see the boat have as it moves in the water, if we were standing on the ground, would be the velocity of the boat, what it is trying to do on their own, plus whatever the river is doing. If they're going downstream, which means with the direction of the river, making it easier, for example, if you were to go downhill, then we see the boat moving faster than what the person is actually rowing. In fact, the person could not be rowing at all and we would still see them moving with the river. If the person is paddling against the river, which is known as upstream, kind of like running uphill, it's harder than what you would normally have to do, then the boat seems to be going a lot slower because whatever you're moving forward at on your own, the river's going to push you backwards. If you're not going fast enough, you'd actually look like if you were rowing backwards as you were overpowered by the river. 
if you were matching the river speed perfectly, we would just see you standing still in one spot as you're rowing going nowhere. All motion is always a resultant motion. So even if I have just an object moving on its own, for example, a person walking on a stationary train, then the resultant velocity would be that of the person plus zero because there's nothing happening from the train. But if the train was moving forward or backward, we would then include that velocity. The term stream is nothing more than a figurative term. The stream is anything that affects the velocity of the object. So it could be a moving platform, a conveyor belt, wind, an actual stream, the rotation of the earth, all of that can play a role, all depending on what your observer is in terms of what they see as affecting the motion of the object. Now, by definition, all velocities are always displacement over time. So the resultant displacement seen by the observer over time must equal the total sum of all the velocities of the system, which is the velocity of the object that you're looking at, plus the velocity of all the individual streams, if you will, that are going to affect that object's motion. And at our level, we will normally have only one stream affecting the object. So again, the resultant velocity of an object seen by, an by a stationary observer or the ground would simply just be the velocity of that object plus the velocity of the streams affecting them. So for our person B case, their resultant velocity, as far as the ground is concerned, or a stationary observer, because we consider the ground to be stationary, is just the velocity of the individual person plus the velocity of anything affecting their motion, in this case, the train. But resultant, again, is going to be the summation of all velocities. So if we had two or three different things affecting this guy's motion, we just include them as well. So we're just adding one vector on top of another on top to another. But this always has to equal the total displacement, the resultant displacement over time. Now let's change our perspective though. Let's say I have person B who's gonna go for a walk on the platform and the platform again is going to be moving forward. Everything is moving exactly the same as before. But this time, the observer is not gonna be A. We're gonna see what the train sees. So if we consider this point right here on the train to be the observer, what would they see? Well, 1.5 seconds later, they would still be exactly here in this spot on the train, and the person would have moved three meters to the right of them. Please notice that the ruler or the origin moves with the observer. So as far as person A is concerned, person B moved eight meters, but our reference doesn't see that because the reference moved five meters. So that removes, is removed from the eight meters, leaving only the three meters that the person walked. The observer doesn't account for their own motion. So as far as the train is concerned, the person traveled three meters to the right at 0.15 in 1.5 seconds. So they have a velocity of two meters per second to the right. And please notice we say right here, relative to the train, we have to declare who the observer is because I'll be very honest. If I'm looking at this scenario and I see the person traveling from here to here in 1.5 seconds, and you're telling me they're moving at two meters per second, that doesn't make any sense, not at all. But as soon as you turn around and say, well, as far as the train is concerned, oh, well, the train is moving forward. So yeah, they'll see the person moving slower. That now makes sense. So we always have to declare what our observer is. This is a very hard thing for us to do because we normally don't do this. Lots of times the velocity is relative to the ground. And instead of saying velocity relative to the ground, we'll just say velocity. And it's implied that since we didn't declare what the observer is, it's the stationary ground. 
but that sets us up for failure because sometimes we mean something other than what we're implying. So always state what the velocity is relative to. Always state what the observer is. So again, if we want to find the velocity resultant, we're just simply adding up all of the individual velocities, the velocity of the object plus the velocity of all the streams. We could also turn around and say that the displacement resultant over time is equal to the displacement of each part of the system, the object and the streams, all divided by the time. Please notice displacement over time is again just velocity. So we're just really saying the same thing over and over and over again. We just keep saying it differently. And if I want to find a velocity that is relative to an observer, then I have to remove the observer's influence from the motion. So that would be the resultant velocity that a stationary observer sees for that object minus what the observer is doing. We're going to get more into this in our next couple of days, but an observer always removes what they see. They don't account for their own influence. Please notice that my velocity relative to the stream is just the velocity of, sorry, it's just the displacement of the object on its own. And that's because if we take a look back up over here in this top corner, we can see that here's my resultant velocity. And if I subtract out what the observer is doing, for example, the train, the only thing left is what the object person B did on their own. It's kind of like if you take a look at two kids that are fighting, you turn around and you, and you stop them from fighting and you ask the question to each kid who started this fight. You'll always hear the same type of situation, uh, the same story from each of the kids saying how the fight was caused by the other person. They had done something to start the fight. They instigated it. They, they started it. They said something. They did something. And both kids will say this with true and utter conviction. Now, the reason for that is most cases when there's a fight, both people have a fault in it. Both people were involved. Both There's something that had happened between them. But from each individual's point of view, I don't notice what I did. So clearly, this person must be to blame. Because if we take a look at the fault of all of us, and I remove what I have done, clearly it's the other person's fault. And you'll see this constantly. Car accidents are another great example on where you will have an accident. Both people are yelling and screaming at the other person, blaming one another. And it's not necessarily that I'm trying to get out of trouble. It's I actually believe the other person's at fault because I didn't do anything. And it's not that I didn't. I just don't know what I did because I don't observe what I'm doing. I'm too busy observing everything else. All things are relative. So for example, if we were to ask this question, does Donald Trump have a lot of money? The question might seem like a very easy answer. However, lots of money is actually a relative thing. Compared to whom does Donald Trump have a lot of money? For example, if we are taking a look at a person who is starting out in life and they're moving out on their own and they have lots of debt and they're having a job and their total net worth is $80,000, Donald Trump, who has a net worth of slightly over $2 billion, has a lot of money. $80,000, $2 billion, I'd like to have the $2 billion, please. But if you were to ask someone like, say Jeff Bezos, where he has a net worth of over $100 billion, then Donald Trump is the poor guy in the room when they're together by a lot. And so this guy could be all kinds of confused and I don't even know how you live on such a small amount of money. And I'll be very honest, I would love to try out this level of poverty just for a little while, if anything, okay? So when we get asked questions about 
is something fast or slow, is something big or small, is something strong or weak, a lot or a little. We have to always keep in mind, compared to what, as seen by what, that's going to be our big thing. All things in life are relative. And most of the problems that we have in life in terms of communication comes from the fact that we fail to state what our reference is. All right, so that's going to wrap this up. If you have a good, kind of a good handle on this, then you're very well prepared for class. If you have questions on this, that's exactly where you need to be. Because as always, this is only to introduce the concept to you so we can start building on it in class and not getting us out of actually teaching this material in class.